Amid the brutality of the war in Ukraine, what some have called a second front looms larger every day as winter approaches. Tonight, Russia's strategic play on the energy front and why it matters for all of Europe. Then, from our Ontario hubs, a look at getting by on the Ontario Disability Support Program. And from Dr. Anthony Fauci's reflections on 50 years in public health to which is the greatest of Great Lakes, we've got the Agenda's Weekend Review. It's Friday, September 23rd, and that's all ahead on the Agenda. Russia supplied 40% of Europe's natural gas last winter. Things have changed. Since the invasion of Ukraine, Russia has shut down pipelines and the European Union now says it will ban all oil imports from Russia by December. The repercussions are significant and growing as winter approaches. With us to examine those in Boston, Massachusetts, Craig Kennedy, associate at Harvard University's Davis Center for Eurasian and Russian Studies, writing a history of Russia's oil industry and a former vice chairman at Bank of America in London. And in Waterloo, Ontario, Besma Momani, Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo and Senior Fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance and Innovation. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Good to be here. All right, so before we begin, let's read a few quotes to set this discussion up. Russia has used its gas supplies as a weapon to foster an energy crisis next winter. That's the EU Energy Commissioner Kadri Simpson in September. Inflation is soaring and rocketing energy costs have raised the prospect of a cold, dark winter. Europe stands at the brink of recession. That was in the Associated Press last month. And then Fatih Burl, the executive director of the International Energy Agency, said in July, we are in the middle of the first global energy crisis. The world has never witnessed such an energy crisis in terms of its depth and consequences. He then goes on to say this winter in Europe will be very, very difficult. Very stark picture as to what Europe will be facing in the next couple of months. I want to get uh, your takes, both your takes on this. Basma, I'll come to you first. How would you characterize what Europe is facing or potentially could face this winter? Well, one thing, we don't know what kind of winter it's going to be. I mean, if it was anything like the summer, which saw heat waves and drought, um, you know, this is, of course, this is happening at a time where climate change is a crisis in and of its own. It will be very, very devastating for Europe. You know, as we saw uh, in all things in the summer, you know, this uh, lack of electricity meant, uh, you know, rationing in some cases, shortages. Uh, we know already of factories that have had to shut down. Uh, you know, some businesses are being clever and sort of using off-peak hours, changing their working hours completely. I mean, there are lots of really interesting policy ideas out there and solutions and, and certainly no shortage of effort, but it's just the absolute lack of supply that is just making things much more difficult. And of course, uh, what this means is that Putin feels very emboldened. And I think he realizes that one way to get at the heart of Europe is to really try to freeze them uh, into submission. And whether or not he uh, wins and achieves this goal is really going to be about uh, how resilient can the Europeans be. Greg, I'll get your take on that as well. I think Bosmus summed it up well, that this really boils down to a question of European resiliency and European resourcefulness. But I think it's also important to point out that this is a premeditated use of gas as an energy weapon. This wasn't in response to some um, uh, uh, action that was taken by Europe after February 24th. Uh, Euro uh, Russia started to draw down gas supplies going into Europe um, months before the invasion in an effort to try and create the sense of energy scarcity in Europe in hopes that that would keep the Europeans off sides and, um, once his invasion went forward. Uh, I think uh, it's also important to point out that Europe is taking uh, efforts to try and relieve uh, some of the immense pressure that's going to come on households through subsidies. Uh, the Germans are rushing to try and put in place temporary uh, liquefied natural gas facilities that would allow them to take more so resources from elsewhere. But it really is a race against time. And some of it does come down to a question of whether how much demand will there be uh, and how um, uh, and how effective will the Europeans be in conservation measures. I'm hoping I can get you in sort of Vladimir Putin's head and help me understand here. How should we understand Putin's strategy here when it comes to natural gas? I'll go to Craig there. So, sure. Really, um, Putin is looking at this not simply as a question of natural gas. It's a question of energy more broadly. Uh, he holds two very big cards. One is gas to Europe 
and his ability to really create turmoil in the gas markets there. But the other one is oil to the rest of the world and his ability to also create a sense of panic or crisis. We've seen him play the gas card already. And to a certain extent, that's an act of desperation. It means that he hasn't been able to um, stop the Europeans from backing, or the West for more broadly from backing Ukraine, and he's having to up the pressure. Uh, the, the thing that is really worrying him now is what happens uh, if the oil sanctions go forward uh, and uh, in, in December and threaten his revenue stream from oil. So expect him in the coming weeks to also start uh, uh, trying to create a sense of panic in the oil markets, perhaps by drawing down uh, export volumes going into the rest of the world. We'll come back to the oil, but Besma, I want to talk to you about uh, natural gas. You know, this is a significant source of revenue for Russia. Is Putin shooting himself in the foot by sort of the stunts he's pulling? I'm afraid he's not hurting. I mean, I think we need to be really, really clear-eyed about this. You know, certainly, uh, yes, uh, the volume of production or export has decreased, but the price has gone up. And so, you know, in some accounts, we saw that actually, and, and even the Russian uh, economy minister even boasted that, you know, revenue is going to go up by an additional 40% uh, on next year. So they don't feel like they're hurting on the financial side. And while I do think that, um, you know, there is going to be increased global pressure on Russia, the reality is there's lots of potential buyers out there who are willing to take Russian oil. And we look at India, we look at, you know, even Turkey, uh, you know, similarly, um, uh, we see China as well, quite interested in Russian oil. Um, and even in some cases, I mean, I think in India as well, you know, they're reselling it at a profit. I mean, there is a lot of willing buyers of Russian oil out there. And as much as I think the West is aligned and certainly I think there's a lot of determination and will to sort of make Putin hurt. The challenge is that much of the rest of the world just is not willing to sort of play by the same game. It's not the same environment that we had, I think, 10 years ago when there was a lot more sort of international coalescing around some sort of joint, you know, messaging here. This is really the world willing to continue to buy Putin's oil. He's not hurting. He's consolidated his power internally. I mean, his greatest, if you will, opposition at the moment are, are hyper-nationalists who want him to double down and be even more forceful in the occupation invasion of Ukraine. So this is really the heart of it. And I'm not suggesting that the sanctions aren't hurting the average Russian individual. That's true. But the Russian people themselves are extremely resilient. You know, they're quite unfortunately, you know, used to this sort of awful uh, regime in place and have learned how to accommodate. Uh, and I think that really means that Russia and Putin himself feels very much emboldened to continue the policy of using energy as a weapon and continue to try to basically blackmail Europe into submission. All right. I want to talk a little bit more about the individual European in, in that sense. Um, you know, European gas prices are six times higher than they were at this time last year and 14 times higher than they were two years ago. And Craig, I want to ask you, and I want to ask you both, uh, start with you, Craig, can Europe make it through winter with zero Russian natural gas? Uh, well, they'll have to. Um, that's what it comes down to. Uh, that's what it will come down to, because Russia will continue trying to, to maintain maximum pressure. It's Putin's best um, strategy at this point. Uh, and it, this is going to cause a great deal of pain for Europe. Uh, Euro Europeans will be paying much higher electricity prices at home, gas prices at home. Uh, I lived in London for decades, and I, I understand how high energy prices are there already compared to North America, and now they're going to be much higher. Uh, but uh, I think coming back to uh, something that uh, was said a moment ago in terms of what uh, Putin is hoping to achieve, uh, in the near term, he is going to, to cause a greater turmoil in the markets, higher prices, and that will, in the short run, mean more revenues for Russia. Uh, but the problem is the, the, the gas weapon is a weapon you can use once um, and hope that it works. And his hope is that uh, the West will back off from its support of Ukraine and back off from oil sanctions going forward, and that um, uh, Putin will be in a much stronger position in terms of being able to maintain revenues. The problem is... Uh, if it doesn't work, if the Europeans hold firm, um, despite all the difficulties, then Russian gas to Europe is uh, history. And the problem is, 
um, uh, Russia's infrastructure for exporting gas is primarily oriented toward Europe. And this is something that you cannot change quickly. It takes many years and billions of dollars of investment, and by the way, Western technology as well, to build new pipelines going to potential Asian demand. So that Russian gas will get stranded and will no longer be generating revenues. The real question becomes what happens with Russian oil? We'll get that. We'll get to that for sure. Besma, I want to get your take on on sort of what Craig said there. You know, what is the impact for Europeans? Should we be expecting blackouts? Should we be seeing? You know, what what is it? What could it potentially look like on the grounds there? Yeah, I think you can't rule that out, and especially Germany. I mean, just as you know, Craig noted, this mutual dependency uh, really is about gas and about pipelines. You know, they do have an ability to export uh, some LNG, but just not nearly as much. So that may, in fact, be the long-term strategy of Russia: is to find more markets and more capability, increase their capability also for LNG. But that pipeline, particularly to Germany, and Germany's vulnerability and dependency on Russia, is the big issue that's structural and may not change, and clearly is not a quick fix because all things LNG, particularly the facilities and terminals needed to build those, take time. It's not an overnight thing. You know, but to the broader point in terms of how this is going to hurt Europe and the average European, it's going to hurt. I mean, I don't think you can ignore that. Um, and this is what really Putin is, is is banking on. You know, you have countries like Italy that have an election coming up. You have a number of countries with, you know, far right nationalists who are very much, uh, you know, looking to Brussels and the European Union as now, you know, um, the scapegoat for all their problems, saying that, you know, this is all about the energy market that the European Union controls over the rights of, uh, of state sovereignty. And it's playing into that us versus them narrative that the populists absolutely thrive on and that Putin is actually feeding. I mean, he actually funds some of these parties and certainly emboldens them. So it's really quite interesting. I think it's not just about the economic uh, fallout of um, all this, uh, you know, price uh, price rises, but it's also the political fallout that we need to watch out for in Europe. These are countries that have strong populist nationalist parties that don't support the West on, uh, you know, liberating Ukraine, that have completely bought the propaganda disinformation that Putin is offering and increasingly are, are frankly winning at the polls. Um, and so that fracturing within Europe is exactly what Putin is trying to do. And unfortunately, uh, democracy as it is means that we may in fact find some of these people voted into office. Craig, I'm hoping you can follow up on what Besma said, talk about political fallout. What exactly does that look like? I, I, I think Basma has summed it up very well. Um, Putin has been uh, trying to convince Europeans not only um, that this, uh, the energy crisis is a result of bad policy in Brussels toward Ukraine, but he's also trying to argue that this is part of Europe's um, uh, ill-conceived program for transition to a green economy, uh, and that there's been massive underinvestment in oil, there hasn't been enough embracing and appreciation of what Russia has to offer, and that Europe only has itself to blame for this. But let's make no mistake about it. Um, uh, while Europe may have made itself vulnerable by becoming overly dependent on Russian gas, it's Putin that um, threw the match onto the Kindle. It's Putin who has decided to shut the gas off as a way of using, uh, as weaponizing it. Uh, and now um, the, the, the challenge for European politicians is to convince their population uh, that they are part of the struggle against Russia alongside Ukraine, and that it's Putin that's causing this and not bad policies in Brussels. All right, let's talk a little bit about what Europe is doing to help sort of ease the crisis that potentially could come uh, in winter. You, talk, you talked a little bit about it, Craig, off the top. Uh, I'm hoping to get your take. What, what exactly uh, can we see in terms of prices uh, for natural gas uh, for Europeans? So prices have been volatile, to say the least. Um, they've been easing a bit uh, in recent weeks. A lot will depend on uh, the amount of demand destruction going forward. If we see recession starting to ease in, as most people are predicting in Europe, uh, that means that energy uh, demand will go down. And therefore, um, uh, even though we have uh, smaller supply, prices will ease. 
Uh, we also see uh, that Europeans are being more successful than most people expected in replenishing uh, their gas storage facilities in Europe. They're six or eight weeks ahead of where they would normally be. Uh, and while um, Basma is absolutely right that th this sort of infrastructure generally takes a long time, there are a few quick fixes. Uh, they may not come in time for this winter, but they are going to provide the prospect of um, uh, uh, more diversification of gas supplies going into, uh, during 2023. Uh, I have in mind in particular these five um, floating uh, regasification facilities uh, that, that Germany is trying to put in place. And, and it's basically a way to bring um, uh, gas from, uh, uh, from Qatar, from, the, um, from Australia on um, ships um, uh, to in liquid form, supercooled, um, then to regasify it and run it into Europe to replace lost Russian gas. But e even as quickly as uh, Europe is trying to move now, it probably won't be in time to to ease uh, the pressure this winter. Basma, I want to follow up with you. You know, the EU has proposed putting on a price cap on Russian uh, gas imports to limit uh, sort of the energy inflation. Is that a a source of, of ease or a solution to this issue as well? I mean, somewhat, yes. Uh, certainly it'll help in, in the short term. And, and there's even other ideas of, of even putting price cap on uh, some renewable energy companies and then sort of redistributing that profit, excess profit, as they call it, you know, to, to the people, to the consumers and businesses. Um, you know, that's one solution, certainly. You know, the big challenge, of course, is clean energy is where we need to go. It's obviously the the most, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, the right answer in that way. It's the right policy decision, but those take time. They're capital intensive. Um, so as Craig noted, you know, LNG facilities are being built in Germany because Germany is probably the most vulnerable. Uh, but those things take time, certainly. And, you know, there are countries in Europe, think of Portugal and Spain, which have done a fantastic job of actually being ahead of the game here and not being dependent uh, on um uh, on other countries by making sure that it does have the LNG facilities and able to source it. And the United States today is one of the largest producers, if not the largest producer in natural gas, and that's opening up lots of opportunities. I mean, Qatar in a bit, they're a bit at their, their, their absolute uh, spare capacity. They don't have any more to give. It's not really, I think, an option. Uh, there was a lot of hope, I think, with the Biden administration in going uh, and talking to the Qataris to try to get them to put more on tap. Um, OPEC, of course, uh, I think is another part of the solution. But there again, uh, we saw their September meeting, um, despite the, the hope that Biden had in going to Saudi Arabia and making that whole a visit to to MBS and taking um, taking a hit, frankly, in terms of his his public rep or his PR and his reputation, uh, it's just not enough. There's just don't have enough uh, capacity. And it's been a hot summer in the Middle East, and so there's also a lot of domestic demand, uh, similarly for for oil and gas, uh, for electricity to um, to run air conditioners. So it really is also a global supply crunch. I mean, this is happening at the worst time. It's not just about Russian oil. There's just a supply crunch, even without bringing in the Russian oil and gas dimension, and then add to that, and of course, you have the situation that we're in right now. Greg, if we were to look at today, right now, who's winning the energy war right now? Well, right now, it would appear that Russia is winning the energy war. Um, uh, they are flush with hydrocarbon revenues. Uh, they seem to have Europe um, uh, in a panic. Uh, and many people in the market think that uh, sanctions on Russian oil won't work. So I think if you looked at it today, just on the superficial um, appearance of things, you'd say Russia is. But if you roll the, the, the tape forward, I think the story changes quite a bit. Craig, you did say looking down the line, I do want to follow up with Besma. The energy historian Daniel Jurgen said that all this completely obliterates Russia's credibility as a reliable natural gas supplier. Looking forward a few years down the line, has Russia just lost the entire European market? I think they'll never forget this, and I hope they don't. They really need to wake up, particularly Germany. Uh, you know, all that fanfare about Nord Stream 2, uh, clearly now I think people have woken up finally um, to the reality that, you know, you cannot be that dependent on Russia. Angela Merkel's strategy unfortunately failed on Russia. I mean, that's the one, I think, element of her foreign policy that was flawed in my view. So, yes, I think Europe is waking up. They will never be dependent on Russia again. Uh, you know, Putin and the regime, it's 
I think, very much consolidated its power. It's not looking like it's going to crumble anytime soon. So it has to invest in finding alternatives. Clean energy is the way to go, but certainly finding uh, ways of ensuring that there's more LNG able to come into the country. Uh, you know, the entire industrial uh, belt of, of Germany is very dependent specifically on natural gas. I mean, this is yet another challenge that they face. So we know that Germany is the industrial powerhouse of Europe, and without natural gas, they're not going to be able to continue to grow. And so there's also a looming recession here that we need to think about or talk about in terms of what's going to happen for Europe too. Craig, I want to come to you. We said I said I would come back and talk oil with you. Uh, you know, Europe plans to ban most Russian oil by December 5th. Do you think this will happen? Markets say, seem to say otherwise, but uh, is that December 5th a, a for sure target? Mm -hmm. So there, there are two components to the ban. One is that Europe will stop buying Russian oil and oil products. Uh, and Europe has for the last 50 years been the primary market for Russian oil and oil products, its refineries, its pipelines, all of its energy infrastructure, not just for oil, but for gas, have been primarily oriented toward Europe. But Europe has also said that they're going to use what um, uh, powers they have, and the G7 are backing them up, uh, as well as some other countries, to prevent Russia from being able to export its oil to um, uh, other countries. Uh, now, I think this is something that's been deeply misunderstood by the market. Uh, there's this belief that uh, Europe doesn't really have the ability to prevent Russia from selling oil to India and China and elsewhere. And um, for some of its export volumes, that's the case indeed. But what people, I think, have missed is um, how Russian infrastructure works. Oil relies on infrastructure just as much as gas does. And part of that infrastructure is the global tanker fleet. Uh, and uh, Europe actually does, not simply through its control of most of those tankers, or at least most of those tanker owners are domiciled in, um, in Western countries, but also through its utter domina uh, domination in um, financing and insuring of those tankers to effectively take most of the global tanker fleet uh, away from um, Russia's uh, um, uh, uh, oil industry. Uh, and the problem for Russia is that it has a very small fleet. It's only able to export 15, maybe 20 percent of Russia's current uh, export um, uh, uh, needs. And so Russia is going to find itself unable to continue delivering anything like the volumes of oil that it does today. And so if you're a buyer in India that suddenly had a windfall of cheap oil, a million barrels a day over the last six months, and these sanctions suddenly kick in, uh, and you go to your Russian supplier and say, where's my oil? They'll say, well, um, I don't have the tankers to do it. They're not saying that yet, but that's what will happen if Russia doesn't agree to sell at this price cap. The price cap allows them renewed access to the infrastructure they need to ship their oil. From what I gather, you're saying that this energy war is won on oil, not at natural gas. Historically, Russia's revenues from oil have been far greater than that from gas. Oil revenues are the glue that holds the Putin regime together. Uh, if you looked at just oil revenues um, during, uh, on the eve of the war, uh, uh, the export revenues going into uh, Russian state coffers were enough to fund 70, 80 percent of this year's Russian budget. They're huge. They're strategic. And if they are slashed, it's going to create, um, it's going to put Russia at a big disadvantage going forward. And the infrastructure needed to to, um, uh, uh, to to move that oil also takes years to build. That's what I was going to say. I see you nodding. I was hoping to get your take on that as well. Yeah, I think looking at the insurance in the industry is really, really key here. And that still is very much Western dominated. So that is really very important here. I agree with that. You know, the challenge, though, of course, is that we've seen a lot of shippers actually, you know, reflag, take the oil illegally. I'm looking at Greek shipping industry that's, uh, you know, I think uh, <laughs> done a few things that were a bit... Um, uh, not unconventional, let's say, uh, on the border of illegal. So there's a lot of, I think, um, you know, illicit oil that's going to find its way on the market. And sure, absolutely agree with Craig that, you know, the pipelines in terms of getting Russian oil out is limited, uh, but they are also building on that. They're very, very conscious of that dependency now uh, and do want to see how they can get more of that pipeline oil, particularly into China. And I think there's a lot of receptivity, of course, with China today to do so. And we've seen this really strong relationship building between President Xi and Putin. So I think that's really something for us to watch. Um, so, yeah, I think, look, we do know 
that um, you know Russia also is very very powerful in OPEC plus. I don't think we can ignore that. Uh, you know Russia has had a very good relationship with OPEC. Uh, OPEC plus is literally born to include Russia, and uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if some very interesting you know backroom deals are happening, uh, really to again circumvent these kinds of sanctions. I don't think we can um, underestimate that. And again, even though countries like Saudi Arabia uh, tend to put out these you know very uh, colorful types of statements suggesting that they're going to keep uh, preserving oil stability and work with the West. I think they're doing a lot of backroom deals that, I fr frankly, I don't think we uh, know all the, the, the types of ways that we're going to see uh, Russian oil circumventing the, the, the markets that we know of. Craig Besma, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, really, really uh, great stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on the program tonight. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Inflation has everyone feeling the pinch of higher prices, but advocates for people living on ODSP, the Ontario Disability Support Program, say it's making things untenable. With us for more, the newest member of our Ontario Hubs team, affordability journalist Kat Eschner. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Dan. All right, so Canadians got a little bit of good news uh, last this week, actually, there was a report that the consumer price index went down to about 7%, but grocery prices are still high and rent isn't getting any lower. Can you give us an idea of social assistance payments versus what's realistically needed for comfortable living? Absolutely. So for starters, as you acknowledge, you know, the overall inflation rate has gone down, but prices are still going up on a lot of important categories, particularly those that we all need, like housing and food. So for social assistance, um, Ontario Dis the Ontario Disability Support Program, which is what you're talking about up top, pays out at $1,227 per month after a recent 5% rate hike from the Ford government. And Ontario Works, which is um, you know income support for anyone who, who can work, but for whatever reason isn't able to earn enough, um, is just $733 a month. Now, I mean, we Doesn't both pay like bills. Right. We both pay bills. It's not a lot of money. Um, so when we're thinking about what a livable amount of money is, um, I think that you can look at a few different metrics. So the official poverty line is around one thousand six hundred and sixty dollars. Um, that's kind of an outdated metric. Just because it's very difficult to keep up with what inflation is doing currently um, with the poverty line. $2,200 is what advocates have suggested might be a more feasible poverty line. But I think the number to really look at when you're thinking about what a livable wage, a livable amount of money to, to make do on, is the SERP pay payout of $2,000 a month. Right. And that's a number that people I interviewed for this story brought up a number of times. They're like, you know, the pandemic has shown us that $2,000 is the floor of what the government deems is an appropriate amount of money to give people to live when they have to step in to help. So why are we still being paid much less than that? All right, so advocates have been calling for doubling of support payments. Uh, it got the attention of the Ontario NDP. How has that helped? Where has that conversation gone? I think this is an interesting one. So the doubling the ODSP idea is not a new idea. Uh, before the election, it was being called for, and it had some attention from parties at that time, um, but only the Greens got on board to actually support a future policy of this. However, even then, talking about doubling the ODSP, talking about raising the rates, um, really meant that like that had to be something that each party had in its platform. And we saw that with the PCs. They actually had to put in place a policy that they would raise um, the rates by 5%. And they've been saying they'll index it to inflation, although that hasn't been done yet, <laughs> um, any foregoing increases. So it's helped get it on the agenda. Um, I think for context, we need to consider how much money that would be. So doubling the ODSP at current rates, uh, so for a single person living alone or um, living in a congregate setting but not with family, mm -hmm. the rate would be $2,454 instead of $1,227. That's a lot more money. Hmm. Um, and for, uh, for an Ontario Works recipient, that amount would be $1,466, which again is a lot more money. Um, and I think that really what this has done is highlighted how how little money these people are currently receiving. 
I asked uh, some people I interviewed for this story about um, what doubling the rates would mean for them. And they pretty much universally said that it would mean more stability. It would mean that they had a little more choice in how and where they lived, a little more agency in what they chose to buy, and the ability to plan for the future in a way that currently they just are, it's very difficult to do on the income they have now. Well, let's talk about that. So, uh, you know, Living below the poverty level can affect every part of, of, of life. I'm, I'm sure there are some, some common themes there. What, peop what are people saying, the, the people that you interviewed uh, for your first story? So I think there are some common themes here. Um, the number one thing I heard about uh, was housing and food. So as to zero in on food for a sec, pretty much everybody I talked to for this story could tell me to the dollar how much certain staples they bought had gone up. Hmm. So they really noticed any impact on their grocery bill. Mitchell Tremblay, one of the men I interviewed, you know, he was talking about how he, he, he lives on just over $9 a day. Um, that's for food, for toiletries, for all, all those things have to go into his $9 a day. So you can imagine that like a $1 inflation on the cost of a loaf of bread, for right. example, would be a huge impact. Some very interesting stuff there. I want to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the response uh, from all the governments. Uh, let's look at what the Ontario government said in part. This summer, our government made the largest increase to ODSP rates in decades. They went on to say, we continue to stress the importance of the federal government delivering on their campaign promise to imp implement the Canadian disability benefit to support Ontarians who need it most and will work with them to achieve it. Our government remains committed to listening and working with individuals, communities, organizations, partners, and all levels of government to empower people and support those in need to reach their full potential. This was in an email uh, that you got yeah. uh, from the government. Give a little background behind that. Right. So what had happened is I had contacted the office of the minister, Marilee Fullerton. She's the minister of children, community and social services, and she's the minister in charge of this file. And I had said, can I interview M Minister Fullerton about what I'm hearing from people on these programs and what the, the government will be doing uh, further to the 5% rate increase they had already introduced. They said she declined to be interviewed. She you know, didn't want to speak to me mm -hmm. for whatever reason, and but they did say, oh, well, we can send you can send in some questions and we'll respond to those questions by email. So I sent in a list of six specific questions about the programs as they are now, any planned increases to rates, any, any, any forward-looking things, and also um, the push to double the rates. What I received back was this response, which didn't substantively address any of those questions uh, or directly address them, and was very in line with the things that Minister Fullerton has said in the House on this on this portfolio, and the things that other ministers have also uh, and Pr Premier Ford have also um, addressed, you know, at different times. So it was. Um, it was not really a response to the questions I was asking, and it was the sort of the same strategy they've been using for a while. Uh, I did post on my Twitter um, the question, both the questions I asked, a screenshot, and the answer, full answer I received. So if anyone's interested, they can look at that. I want to get uh, your take as well uh, in terms of the Liberals and Greens. Have they weighed in in terms of not only on the 5% as well, but just sort of the unaffordability right now for a lot of people, Ontarians? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, uh, like, from looking at the House, the minutes of uh, the House session so far, every party has raised the issue of ODSP in Ontario Works in some way. Um, so the NDP is now f pretty much firmly behind this double the ODSP program push. Um, the Greens have been there for a while. The Liberal Party has been a little quieter on this file, but they haven't said nothing. Uh, there are two people in the House who've spoken about this so far. So they're currently calling for a 20% rate hike on ODSP and Ontario Works, and a review of the idea of a universal basic income program, mm -hmm. which is another way of addressing this problem. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be through these very means-tested, very you know, onerous programs that are difficult to access. It could be through another another method. All right, so you talked about solutions there. There seems like an obvious one, but based on your research, what do you think it is? Looking at everything that advocates and people on these programs have said about it, looking at everything that has been tried in the past, it's hard to think that the solution is not, in some way, just more money getting to people on these programs who need to live. Kat, really great stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. My pleasure. The agenda this week debated the future of bilingualism in Canada, considered the conservative appeal to working class people, and examined this country's problem as a haven for money laundering. The agenda's Week in Review begins asking, which Great Lake is the greatest of all?
have a look. We're going to start with some opening statements here, and we'll go in order of size. So Lake Superior, come on in here, get us started, and tell us why your lake is the greatest great lake. It's in the name. I am Lake Superior, as my infamous Twitter handle suggests. Lake Superior is the greatest of the lakes. It feeds the water for all other four, the four other Great Lakes and is large enough to contain all the water of the Great Lakes, including three extra Lake Eries. If that's not great, I don't know what is. Some strong points there, Megan Leslie. You're doing Lake Huron. That's the second biggest. What have you got to say? Well, it's hard to pick just one lake. So luckily with Lake Huron, you don't have to because it's two <laughs> lakes for the price of one. It is Lake Huron. It is also Georgian Bay. Mm. That's part of Lake Huron. So two different ecosystems, two different cultures, uh, two different experiences. Also some strong points there, Your Worship. What have you got to say? What I've got to say is that when you think of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, this is like Goldilocks and the Five Lakes. And when you look at the Five Lakes, I'm going to take you through, over the course of the next half hour, I'm going to take you through why Michigan is the perfect lake. Unlike Superior, which is too big and too cold. The other one is Lake Huron, is <laughs> too rocky. Lake Erie is too shallow. Lake Ontario, I'll get into why Lake Ontario is not <laughs> the top, but Michigan will be number one at the end. Like Goldilocks, just right. Just right. All right, gotcha. Serene Fox, come on in here. Lake Ontario is the best because? Well, it is small, but it is mighty. Lake Ontario is actually, you know, you called it out. You said Superior had in its name. But one of the traditional names for Lake Ontario is Nigani Gichigami, which means the leading sea, which quite frankly makes it the leader of all lakes. And if you follow my traditional migration story, you'll come to see just how important it is. So yeah, Lake Ontario has some of the most iconic coastlines in Ontario in Canada. So I'm looking forward to telling you just a little bit why Lake Ontario is absolutely the best lake. And we look forward to hearing it. Okay, Tony Decker, you're batting fifth in this lineup here today. Why is Lake Erie the best? Uh, Lake Erie is the best um, because uh, it's, you, it's comfortable to swim in uh, all summer long. Um, there's beautiful beaches. Uh, it has uh, 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 Point, Point Pelee and Pelee Island is a, is, a, is a through route for migratory birds, super important for, for, our, um, for our environment. Um, and uh, the Lake, Lake Erie provides the lake effect that has, uh, creates the microclimates that's perfect for growing uh, fruits and vegetables and grapes in the Niagara region. So all of that stuff we enjoy from the Niagara region is a result of Lake Erie's uh, lake effect. I have to say, strong opening statements from everybody here. This may be more difficult to uh, judge than one had thought. So let's go around for a second round here. Okay, Lake Superior, come on in here. You gave us the opening statement. Let's dive in a little deeper now. You've heard some of the criticisms. Lake Superior is too big. It's too cold. What do you say to that? Too cold? There's no such thing as too cold. <laughs> There's just too weak. You know, there are... Part of Lake Superior's power are the intense conditions, the 30-foot waves, the um, blustery wa the blustery winds, and uh, the squalls. It is a beautiful uh, to experience that inclement weather. All right, Megan Leslie, you heard the criticism over here. Lake Huron, too rocky. Oh, come on. So we have Lake Huron, and when you go, you know, Sarnia to Tobermory, it's got these white sand beaches. They're beautiful, lots of swimming, big waves. And then you do have the rocky shores of Georgian Bay, those iconic images of that, that white pine blown and twisted in the wind. So it's, I think it's really exciting and dynamic that you get the best of all worlds with just this one lake. It's very group of seven, isn't it? Isn't it? It really is. You look like you're looking at a painting when you're you walk through the Georgian Art Gallery Bay. of Ontario and you're basically right there. Right on. Now, okay, Walter, I, I, I'm going to put this out here because I think maybe you have the toughest job of all the five representatives here. You. Because your Great Lake, is any of it in Canada at all? It's all American. It's got four states that touch Lake Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. Mm -hmm. So it is an American lake. There's good Americans out there. <laughs> and this is the great American lake. Hmm. And when you think of Michigan, you think of freshwater surfing. It actually has the best waters to surf in freshwaters out of all the freshwaters in North America. If you've ever been to Sheboygan, you know that you can surf in the Great Lakes.
the current prime minister's father, did have a dream once upon a time of a country where millions of people could speak both official languages and communicate basically in both official languages. Not perfectly, but basically. Is that dream, in your judgment, essentially dead? Well, for someone of my generation, obviously, I, I, I'm the first generation to have grown up under official bilingualism. So for someone of my generation, uh, when Quebec politics, for instance, was at the core of a lot of what happened in this country, um, the dream is dead. I mean, I write a column for the Globe and Mail, and because I'm based in Quebec, I write a lot on Quebec politics, and I just notice over the years how um, there's so much less interest in the rest of the country for Quebec politics, and there's so much less investment on the part of Canadians outside Quebec in trying to uh, bridge the cultural divides in the country. Um, and that's partly, of, I mean, largely a function of how much Canada has evolved since the Official Language Act was passed. <laughs> there are more people who speak Mandarin and Punjabi outside um, Quebec in large parts, or certainly in most parts of the country, than speak French. And so um, that, and partly it's a function of the fact that there's just not enough uh, qualified teachers outside of Quebec to actually teach Quebec French to English Canadians. So it's a, it's a complicated story, but yeah, I do think the dream is dead. Was the dream, JJ, in your p opinion, a fool's errand to begin with? I think it was. I think it was always based on a fund fundamental misunderstanding of what this country was. You know, I think when you had leaders like Pierre Elliott Trudeau, these were people that were very much products of Quebec political culture that very much sort of conceptualized the existence of Canada as like a marriage between Quebec and Ontario. And that was like the fundamental reality of this country. And thus, a policy like bilingualism made a kind of sense if you conceptualize the country that way. as kind of a marriage, you know, this, the two founding nations, a very Eastern Canadian sort of centric conception of what this country is. You know, I'm from Western Canada, I'm from Vancouver, so we have a very different understanding of the history of this country, which is that, yeah, perhaps that's how the country started, Ontario and Quebec, and then, you know, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, but then, you know, the entire Western half of this continent was you know, annexed and colonized and was uh, settled by waves of people from Eastern Europe, from other parts of Europe, speaking all sorts of different languages and then, you know, people coming from, from Asia and from Africa and elsewhere and creating, you know, what I think even by the 19... Uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, was already a very diverse multicultural country in which the idea that this was fundamentally a bilingual, bicultural country was a, just a dated and incorrect assumption. And I think what we've seen over the last 50 years is a failed social experiment based on false assumptions trying to turn this country into something that never it wasn't even at the time that the Official Languages Act was introduced. A failed social experiment. Well, let's come back to that uh, legislation, which was the Official Languages Act. Uh, we, we think about it in terms of bilingualism, but if you read the legislation, it allows for Canadians to remain monolingual. It's the public service from the federal government that will be offered in the language of the citizen that requests the services. So it's, it's not an, a, a, a legislation to uh, make every Canadian bilingual. The dream is at a, a, another level, I would say. It has been a vision. That uh, of the politicians of that time. But you and do you still ascribe to that dream? Do you still aspire I think, to that dream? Well, it is partly achieved uh, and mostly uh, where the, the highest concentrations of bilinguals are in Quebec, mm -hmm. in uh, particularly Montreal, in, among the uh, all the uh, francophone minorities uh, outside of Quebec. That's where the level of bilingualism is the strongest. Louisa, to what extent do you think francophones who live outside of the province of Quebec, to what extent do you think they currently feel under threat? Um, some of them, I think, with the recent census data, feel definitely under uh, threat. And I really want to underline what my colleague, um, Monsieur Lapri, just said about the actual numbers have been growing, even though the statistics, the percentages uh, go a different trend. And depending on, on the regions and the locations, the geography does play a role, both in the degree of bilingualism the possibility to live in one or both languages and the feeling of uh, threat. So currently with the numbers and some of the recent policies, uh, Francophone minorities feel under threat. Even within Quebec, being in 
Quebec City, in Montreal, or in Gatineau is very different. In Gatineau, there is definitely more of a feeling of a threat because of the presence at the interprovincial border um, with Ontario of English being there and potentially invading. Sean, I want to pick up on that line. We have changed what it means to be a progressive conservative in Ontario. And the Premier's contention that he's created a new coalition, which obviously includes private sector labor unions as part of it. Do you see that as a grand new coalition in Ontario politics these days? I, I think the short answer is yes, Steve. Um, in a way, Canada is um, slow in this broader trend occurring across um, Western societies, what's sometimes referred to as a realignment of our politics. Viewers will be familiar with Donald Trump's um, un unorthodox voter coalition or um, the British Conservatives' breaching of the so-called Red Wall in, North in the nor Northern England in the, in the 2019 election campaign. It reflects a kind of a, a sorting of our politics in which education is increasingly a major proxy for whether you vote for the left or you vote for the right. Um, and I think what the Ford has done, frankly, better than any conservative in the country, is start to recognize this trend and reorient um, the party's messages and policy agenda to reflect um, this new accessible voter voting group, um, uh, which comprises um, working class um, Canadians. Armin, I'll put a different quote to you, this one from an NDP insider who said about the last provincial election, we gave up the working class to get the chattering class, and we do great with the chattering class. So said this NDP insider. Uh, if that's accurate, do you agree that was a bad trade? If it's accurate, it was a bad trade. But is it accurate? So I think there's a lot going on here. I agree with Sean that Canada is late to the party, but within Canada, the Conservatives have been the most adept at understanding that population aging means the smallest working age cohort we have seen in half a century, and their vote is very valuable and it's time to go after them. And so they wrap themselves in the flag of the working class, but in fact do not represent the working class or present a path. Their policies, their messages are on, but their policies are not on to the path that is required to move uh, towards the economy of the future, which is going to value workers more and more. And that's actually the fight for all parties to take part in. The Conservatives just got out the gate fastest. <laughs> okay, John, uh, in your view, has the NDP given up on the working class? in order to get the chattering class? Well, yes and no. I'm not sure about the premise of this question. If, if you look at the coalition that Mike Harris put together in the 1990s, you look at the coalition that Doug Ford has put together now, I'm not sure it's all that different. Um, traditionally, the Liberals and the NDP own the city centres, whether it's Toronto or Ottawa or London. Um, the Conservatives own the rural areas, and then they fight over the suburban ridings in between the two, especially the suburban ridings of the 905, the, the ridings that are outside Toronto. And in the mid-1990s, Mike Harris put together a coalition of rural and suburban voters, immigrant voters, working-class voters, middle-class voters, that I think resembles a lot the coalition that Doug Ford put together uh, as well. That said, um, it is clear throughout the Western world that there is a move afoot by conservatives to grab the loyalties of working class voters. And and to some extent, it's succeeding. I'm not sure yet how much it's succeeding in Canada and whether it's succeeding at the federal level rather than the provincial level, but it's out there. And of course, it is based not on economic values. You know, it's the what's the matter with Kansas argument? Why do working class voters not vote for policies that one uh, believes would advantage the working class? It might be because there are other things other than economic self-interest. I think this is going to come to news, come as news rather, to many people that we are apparently a haven for money launderers. Are we really? 
You know what, Steve? Yes, we are. Um, so Canada has a AAA credit rating. We are a G7 country. Uh, we have a modernized international system of trade. Um, and that makes us incredibly lucrative to money launderers worldwide. The more stable of an economy you have, the more attractive it becomes to launder money. Uh, experts estimate anywhere between 45 billion to 113 billion is laundered annually each year. And this is known as snow washing, where international marketing firms um, or inter international law firms have marketed Canada as a secrecy jurisdiction to incorporate a shell company for the sole purpose of uh, avoiding tax and to launder money. Now, Mark, I suspect most people know what money laundering is, but for those who don't, what's your best definition of what money laundering means? Uh, my best definition would be you take something that is illegal to get the profit out of it and then you recycle it into the economy but into something legit. So you take something which is totally illegal and you convert it into a legit activity by using, as Sasha was pointing out, the shell company and other operating companies too. And do you agree we're one of the big countries in the world where this happens? Oh, yes, we are. Uh, it's <laughs> not something that we should be proud of, but yes, we are. And you also sign on to this anywhere from 45 billion to 113 billion. That's an enormous amount of money. Oh yes, and uh, I would have no no problem believing that it's probably closer to 100 billion dollar than it is to 40 40 something billion. Hmm. Uh, it's only an estimate, but to be honest with you, it's really hard to come up with a clear number because it is actually illegal. So they're not disclosing it in financial statements, but uh, it's at least 100 million dollars. Very very lucrative. Huh. Okay, Rita, we've got an organization in this country called FinTrack, which is supposed to keep an eye on this. What's FinTrack? FinTrack is our federal anti-money laundering watchdog. It is the financial intelligence unit for Canada. And it collects um, a lot of information from banks and other uh, reporting entities on suspicious transactions that take place. So it's, it's a data collection agency um, to a large extent. So a bank, for example, if it notes a transaction uh, is suspicious in some way, It'll write up a report, it'll send it to FinTrack, and FinTrack, uh, you know, is used by law enforcement. The information that they provide is used by law enforcement to prosecute these cases. And what would be something that would be considered suspicious? How is it suspicious? I mean, there's, uh, it's pretty broad definition. I mean, anything can be considered suspicious. I mean, there's a lot of talk of, you know, if a transaction is over $10,000, it is automatically flagged to FinTrack. That's true. But a bank doesn't necessarily have to wait for uh, somebody to cross that $10,000 threshold. Anything can be considered suspicious. FinTrack collects a lot of data. Um, millions and millions of reports go to FinTrack every year. But there is a question, and this was addressed by the Cullen Commission, you know, there is high volume reporting to FinTrack, but how effective is that? It turns out, uh, I'm one of them, I know you're one of them, a lot of people who got vaccinated got COVID anyway. And a lot of people who got vaccinated transmitted the disease to other people as well. And I'm wondering if, as you look back at it, and admittedly, hindsight's 2020, do you have any regrets about the salesmanship used to convince people to get vaccinated? In other words, did you oversell them? Did you give people the sense that if they get vaccinated, they're sort of in the clear, when in fact, quite clearly, that has not been the case? Well, as you say, retrospectively, Steve, certainly if you look back now, there has been understandably a misunderstanding about what a vaccine can do. The one thing that has been crystal clear, that the differences in severity of disease and death and hospitalization between vaccinated and unvaccinated people is profound. The, the likelihood of getting into a severe situation leading to hospitalization and deaths in an unvaccinated person is multi, multi-fold higher than in a vaccinated person. Yet, there is a perception that vaccine will prevent you against infection, and that isn't the case. It does somewhat prevent you from getting infected, but not nearly as well as it does to prevent you from getting severe disease. So it's understandable how a person can say, well, I've been vaccinated and I've been boosted and I still got infected. So what you were telling me wasn't particularly true. I thought I was gonna get protected 
against infection. When the real issue is that if you didn't get boosted, the likelihood that your infection, which likely was mild to moderate, might have put you in the hospital and might have killed you. That message in the beginning was not as clearly articulated as it likely should have been. Now we know, and we say that all the time, you get vaccinated and boosted to protect you against severe disease. But it is understandable how early on when the vaccines first came out that people had the understandable perception that it was going to protect them against getting infected. You faced not only uh, considerable admiration from people who appreciate your public service, but also, I think it's fair to say, unprecedented hate in your life as well. I mean, people have tried to kill you. The governor of Florida said you, ought to, you were some little elf who need to be chucked across the Potomac River. Why do you think there's a, I mean, it's <laughs> some of the stuff is laughable, I agree. Uh, why do you think such a sizable chunk of the American population uh, not, not only distrusts you, but has actually come to despise you. Yeah, I, you know, what, what I think it really is, Steve, is a reflection of the profound uh, divisiveness that we are experiencing in this country, the likes of which I have never seen. I, you know, I'm an elderly person. I'm 81 years old. I've been involved here at the NIH for almost 60 years. I've been the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases for 38 years. And I've been involved with multiple outbreaks leading from HIV AIDS through Ebola and Zika and pandemic flu and the anthrax attacks and now COVID. I've never seen a public health issue get entangled in political divisiveness the depth of which we see in this country. It really is striking, and it should never spill over into the field of public health. That's just some of what we've covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, September 23rd, 2022, Monday. We're putting the spotlight on the Great Lakes again and asking whether Canada is neglecting its duties towards them. I'm Jane Jagnathan. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend and we'll see you again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.